Daily gold change 5,575. Ooh, that's a unique quantity of money because um, that's just one tiny little factory and it just paid for 50% of its upfront cost. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the Spiffing Brit and today we're playing Bannerlord. Now, this game has just released into early access and you know what that means, ladies and gentlemen. Fresh pickings for exploits. This is the long-awaited sequel to Mountain Blade Warband. When I say long awaited, I mean really, really long awaited. And as you can probably guess, just about everyone in the entire world is playing it at the moment, because of course it is a very fun game. Although because it's in early access, it's very buggy. So we're going to see if Bannerlord is a perfectly balanced game with no exploits today. If you're new here, welcome, do consider subscribing. And if you're extra majestic, you might have even given the video a like. So sit back, relax, grab yourself a nice cup of Yorkshire tea, make yourself right at home and let's dive into this video. But before we actually jump into any of the exploits today, ladies and gentlemen, what do you think Spiff's actually going to destroy today? Is he A, going to find a way to get unlimited money? B, find a way to get unlimited free troops? C, find a way to get unlimited experience? Or D, all of the above with extra helpings of Yorkshire tea? Go down into the comments section and vote and you may be right. Let's dive into this video. So today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be demonstrating quite a few fun little exploits exploits for you. You see, the developers have got a very nice custom character creation where you can make your perfect chappy and send them off into the world to go conquer it, or just make a lot of money, or just do whatever, maybe just raid a bunch of places, whatever floats your boat. The only downside is the developers forgot that one issue might arise with the game, that is that it might fall into my hands. And in those hands, we found ways to make money. Oh, some ways that really should not have been discovered. And then, using that money is also completely broken and I'll be demonstrating that later on. Anyway, it's time to create our character. So who's going to be our super powerful character today? A Vlandane, so who get more upgrade and XP stuff, a Sturgeon for lower penalty in snow, an Empire for construction speed, extra speed on horses, more speed in forests, yeah. So basically, three of these upgrades are useless because their speed bonus is in minor regions. Why on earth you'd want that? I don't know. We don't really care about speed. Empire, sure that's great but you've got to control actual towns and cities in order to get that bonus. Vlandians, I don't even care. Who we care about, that's just pretty much useless. You're going to upgrade your troops no matter what. They'll die before they hit max level anyway, if you're playing it right. We're going to be playing as the Asari. Reason why, caravans are 30% cheaper to build and there's a 10% less trade penalty. These are the trade boys and trust me, the trade boys know how to make money. So it's time to make our character today, ladies and gentlemen. I know, a lovely powerful character. Going to give him love and defined cheekbones just like that. However, instead of that lovely spiffy moustache or any of that facial paint, we're going to whack on a proper big bushy beard. And here we have it, ladies and gentlemen, our legendary character. Just look at him. He's a majestic and happy chappy. Little does he know it, but we're going to actually take him on into the world of Calradia and he's going to conquer the entire thing. Although he's going to do it with as little fighting as feasibly possible. So he wants to actually invade land. You don't need to in this game. Anyway, we need to create an upbringing for our lovely child and of course what you're going to do is just spam all of the merchant options so that you max out your trade stats as fast as possible. There you go, just drop them all in. And of course when it says before your life set out for adventure, your biggest achievement was investing some money in a workshop. This is very useful because we also gain a skill in smithing, which you're actually surprisingly going to need. So here is our legendary character, the fantastic Spiff. I know, look at him, he's majestic. He's going to be making a lot of money and don't worry, he's not going to look silly like that for much longer. Oh my, look at the wiggle physics on this. Yes, sword is just one long salami stick. It's just really wiggly. And the bows are inside of Spiff's arm. Oh, that's not comfortable at all. Anyway, let's throw ourselves into the game, whack everything to normal difficulty, and trust me, do not enable death. Good God. That's painful stuff indeed. Anyway, it's time for us to start the game. Now that we've finished the little tutorial section, which I've skipped over, we actually need to create a family name for ourselves. And of course, we're going to go for the Brit as our family name. So we are, of course, Spiff of House Brit. Oh, and of course, we need to make our lovely banner. Oh, well, when it comes to banner, Banner design, of course. What do we go for? Oh, the humble tea leaf. What a beautiful design. Oh, now look at that. Doesn't that just inspire you when you see such a beautiful tea leaf? Majestic indeed. When you start out the game, you only have yourself and a thousand dinars to basically get you by. Now, for most characters, this is kind of a death sentence, but for ourselves, this is actually pretty good indeed. Because of the character setup we have, in actual level one, we can sink a focus point into trade, and focus points are basically a way of 
of saying, I want to specialize in this category. So because we've specced so much into trade and we have a social skill of five, we're going to learn the trade skill at 14 times the normal rate. Trust me, this is very necessary because learning the trade skill takes a really long time. Also, 100%, please pick up wholesaler. If you don't, you lose the campaign. Very important. And then charm. Lovely stuff. Pick up charm as well. Good stuff. So we have got a lovely trading character. And how on earth do you trade in this game? Well, you simply buy products from one place and sell them to another. Now, because we're early in the game, we only have a carrying capacity of 30, which is not really enough to move any goods about in any profitable way. So we're going to need to use exploit number one in order to generate enough money to become a trader, because 1,000 just isn't enough. Now, in order to get ourselves started, we've purchased 648 golds worth of salt from the settlement of Aptifina over here, for only 18 gold pieces each. Now, we were recently in Poros and we saw that the price of salt was much, much higher than that. And so even though we are massively over encumbered, we're going to slowly waltz our way over to Poros and drop off all of our salt. Now, I did actually have to drop off some of the salt and recruit a couple of lads because I was getting chased around by bandits most of the time. But the salt, which we managed to buy for only 18, we can sell here for 40, meaning we get 700 of our gold back. Anyway, how do we gain more resources? Well, we can take our small squad of men over to Onika here. Onika here sells olives. Olives we can buy for 20 and sell for 42. So we're going to buy as many olives as we physically can, even go over the party limit just a little bit and also recruit a couple more men just so that we can carry more goods and then move the goods all the way back to Poros where we can then trade them off for 42 each. Very nice. Now we're up to 1,100 gold and we have a party of six dudes. Lovely stuff. Now in order to really get the trade rolling in, it's a good idea to buy a couple of pack mules because they're really going to increase the amount of carrying capacity you have. They provide 100 each which is really good. Also I'd strongly suggest walking around with a group of about eight men and just feeding them only grain and that should keep them on side and happy with you which is good oh that was one incredible fight with the looters um they outnumbered us but we did manage to beat them and some men did flee the battle good stuff and there we go we've leveled ourselves up oh we even get some prisoners too lovely lovely Though a lot of our men are now dead because of that but you know these things happen now once again we're going to buy a bunch of olives as well from the exact same settlement for about 20 each and then ship them all back to poros once more it is literally just around the corner and we make a profit of about 10 on each of them. There we go, we're now up to 1,400 gold. And we've actually leveled up our trade stat to 47 as well. Very nice. Now I've made my way over to Tarcticus, which is just a little bit further on, and these guys produce grapes. Now grapes are incredible because they only cost 20 to purchase, and you can sell them for 63 at Vostrom, which is not actually too far away from us. So we're going to buy 45 grapes and make our way over to Vostrom, which is just a quick hop for our little caravan. Now grapes aren't that good to sell in Poros sadly but that doesn't really matter because we can still stop off here for a trade and buy ourselves another two mules to give us a carrying capacity of 590 which is of course very nice. Anyway onwards to Vostrum with our brand new upgraded party. Oh and look at that we're moving so much faster now 5.1 speed 4. May not look like much but trust me this is true pod racing now. And here we have it we arrive at the lovely city of Vostrum where we can deposit some wool which I bought and seeing that grapes are actually not selling for much here we're actually going to move on. Yes, the grape trade is not strong here. We must go to other places. So it's time for us to head to Danustica. Danustica is a lovely city. Very, very useful little city to have. We're going to be doing a lot of business with it later. Now, you might be sat there wondering why on earth is trading so overpowered in this game? Well, it's overpowered for one very, very strong and simple reason. If you look at your character's skills, you see the trade skill tree is a pretty perfectly normal balanced skill tree. You have your little modifier here so that you don't have to upkeep your workshops that much and you get more carry weight. You have this one here so that workshops gather average price rumors which is very useful. You can add toll gates and distributed goods, artisan communities and all that. But the most important one by a very 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 long shot is the everything has a price upgrade. This requires a level of 225 in trading but when gained you can now trade settlements when doing barter. Bartering is a lovely simple mechanic where you you can walk up to any lord or character and say to them, hello, I would like insert thing from your inventory. I will give you either gold or something from my inventory for it. In our case, we can give gold. Lots and lots of gold. Oh my goodness, I found just a tiny little villager in the middle of nowhere where for some reason they're willing just to buy grapes at a price of 30. Well, that's fine. That's going to improve my trade skill. Thanks. Lovely person. Evidently, you haven't had a grape supply wagon in a very long time. Now I'm going to buy a metric ton of hardwood here because you know, it's 
ridiculously cheap at only 19 and there we go we've purchased ourselves 61 units of hardwood now hardwood has many uses you can use it to trade and gain money that way you can also use it to cause a few shenanigans in the game you see currently the economy of the game is a smidge broken not only can you sell resources to villages at way above the price you should actually be able to sell them at you are also able to abuse the smithing mechanic in this game you see you can buy yourself a bunch of these crappy iron pitchforks for 66 gold each same for these pickaxes and these pitchforks and these simple bastard swords they're quite good 151 each so you can buy all of these bad boys for 745 we paid and then what we can do is smelt them down for resources so we can turn these two pitchforks into two bits of wood fantastic we can turn this simple bastard sword into four wrought iron and two iron as well as one crude iron which is a fantastic trade for one piece of charcoal and then we can actually just go back and sell the resources we gained so one piece of iron is enough to actually pay for the bastard sword which we smelted down it only costs 151 to buy it and yet we've managed to sell its parts for 430 we can do the same for the wrought iron and the crude iron and we can also sell some of our hardwood as well which we gained lovely stuff that's how the smithing mechanic is pretty cheesy early on in the game so we're going to buy the other two bastard swords as they are the most perfectly balanced weapon to use this with they only cost us 302 and we're going to convert them into more than that remember 302 to buy how much are they going to sell for ah 1413 oh game i mean that's um that that doesn't feel very balanced now does it especially considering you can get these swords from fighting in battles so yes if you are out in the fields fighting people do not sell the weapons take the weapons back to a smithy you don't even need any skills in the smithing tree and just melt them down into pure money so we've made our way up to 3800 dinars at the moment but we are going to need more so we're going to buy a bunch of flax to sell at danustica which is always a great thing to do we can buy some furs as well they're quite useful they do sell for a fair bit and even buy some silver ore why not and bam after that trade our trade skill is now up to 50 and we have 4,000 gold in the bank so why not visit danustica and see what lovely weapons they have oh, they have no weapons in fact we can sell pitchforks and pickaxes to them i mean why not because they're just garbage but wow never expect that from such a town so we've gone to honora once again bought a sword for 151 and we're going to smelt this bad boy down so we spent 151 buying the sword and we'll sell the sword's components for 513 another glorious upgrade now let's go sell the rest of this hardwood and so we sell all of our hardwood and we'll bam even more profit we're now up to almost 5,000 gold now this process of just hopping back and forth buying hardwood or fish or grapes and grain from over here and trading them or the lovely hardwood trade where you can buy hardwood from here or this village and run it down to Danustica or Husenfulk is up to you. You can do any of those, you're going to make a lot of money and you want to keep doing those until you hit around about level 20 and then that's when the magic funds go and start happening. So you join us sometime later, we now have 10,000 gold in our inventory and we've actually improved our clan a bit, we're almost clan tier 2 but most importantly we have a few companions with us who are able to aid us in combat which is very useful. Now a interesting thing has happened here with the game's economy you see grain is actually selling from Danustica at a cost of nine which is um, a unique price for grain to be at to say the least now because grain is selling at only a cost of nine that means we can probably sell it for more than nine because I'm pretty sure that's the lowest the game will even allow it to go we can then take our legendary grain supply just over this bridge heading all the way to Honora where we are going to sell about 300 units of grain yes we've now hit the point where we are moving massive quantities of goods about because we have nine mules and eight sumpter horses who are providing 1,700 carrying capacity which is very useful stuff indeed at the end of the day carrying capacity is speed and we bought this grain for nine and we can just dump all of it into the market over here to get the price down to 10 there we go a lovely trade oh we've managed to actually improve a level and get up to trade level 66 which is very good now with all of our fantastic trade we're hitting the point where we can actually buy our first caravan now caravans in this game are a fantastic fantastic source of infinite wealth and I strongly recommend everyone purchases as many as they can and also once again another lovely easy trade is to buy salt from Danustica here and sell it to the city bordering it just to the south now as you will notice the map borders have changed a bit because the southern empire has expanded massively for some reason in the current build of the game the southern empire are just very 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 powerful I'm yet to see them lose a single fight anyway let's sell that salt now even though it's a risky time to do this because I only have 16 
15,000 in the bank, we are going to actually start our first exploit here right now, ladies and gentlemen, and it's going to be broken. From this point on, we have just unlocked the infinite money button. You see, as soon as you hit around about 15,000, ladies and gentlemen, what you can do is hop into the city of Honora here and just take a walk around the city center. Now, this game, like the previous game, has workshops. These workshops produce goods and the goods are sold on the market. And of course, they make a profit depending on how well the goods sell. Now, in this lovely city here, they have a wool weavery, a velvet weavery and a pottery shop. Two fantastic businesses, I'm sure, but they're probably only making around about a few hundred or so a day. A few hundred or so a day is not enough for me. No, 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 no. We need much, much more than that. You see, there's currently a bit of an issue with the game's coding, and that would be that one business seems to... Oh, please ignore the uh, deadly texture on the floor as well. That's fine. It's not there. Early access game. <laughs> it's fine. But yes, there seems to be an issue with the game's coding, and that's that there is currently no balance with the workshops. Some workshops are just objectively better than others, and can be built in just about any location and still make a ridiculous amount of profit. So we're going to go to our shop worker here and say I'd like to buy this workshop. It will only cost you 13000 to buy. What a lovely idea. Of course we're going to do it. Now he probably wants us to keep it open as a wool workshop, which is what it is. Instead, we're going to choose the wood workshop option. You see, the wood workshop crafts bows and shields out of just simple hardwood. And this is a fantastic idea. So we've sank 13000 into that, ladies and gentlemen. A great start, I must say, as well. Now, as you can see, we have our carpenter here. Costs 100 wages. And tomorrow, it's going to give us some money. Now what the carpenter does is, as the game expressed, buys hardwood off of the local market and makes goods using it. Now because we have a hardwood village right here, hardwood is very likely to end up on that market at a very low cost. But we can also manipulate the market by buying 170 hardwood from this local little village here and dumping it onto the local stock exchange. Sure we might not necessarily make much of a trading profit, but what does matter is something else entirely. So we're going to dump all of the hardwood we gained into the market and technically make a loss on it, ladies and gentlemen. Oh no, what a shame. But what if that loss lasts for no time whatsoever? So simply sit back, relax, and just wait in the village for some time. There's no rush, ladies and gentlemen. The local wood workshop is about to do its magic. Now, it's going to take a while for this carpenter to come online. In its first day of operation, it made 51 gold, which is lovely. It meant we didn't really lose much money operating our army, but I'd actually like that wood workshop to actually pay itself off. But don't worry, all of that will come with time. Oh, gold change 211. Did we just gain 211 gold? Looks like we did. Our wood workshop is now actually making money. Very strange. Oh no, I wonder what this could possibly mean. Oh, and now it's really starting to happen, ladies and gentlemen. Daily gold change 5,575. Oh, that's a unique quantity of money because um, that's just one tiny little factory and it just pays paid for 50% of its upfront cost. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Well, this is certainly a unique situation to be in, and you know what we're going to do. We're just going to keep dumping hardwood onto the local market, because we can. Oh, we might as well just wait in the city until the next day ticks over and we get our next injection of cash. Oh, look, 4,000. Lovely stuff. Now, I think this is bugged because there's an extra zero in here somewhere. Most other workshops are going to be making you around about 364 rather than 3,641. But nonetheless, we can just kind of sit back, relax, and let the money tick in. One thing else we can actually do is we can talk to our workshop and we can actually sell it for 30,000. Now, considering we bought this workshop for 11,000, this is absolutely ridiculously fantastic. Anyway, we're just going to let it tick by and then with the next injection of cash we should actually be able to set up, yes, yet another workshop and that's what we're going to do. We're going to buy some hardwood from Odrisa here and probably set up another workshop in Danustica. So we're going to dump all of the hardwood onto the trade market of Danustica and actually make a nice decent profit off of the back of it and also walk around the town centre to find the local wood workshop. Well actually it won't be a woodworking shop but it will be. Now whilst you can make money using trading and I have probably made around about a hundred thousand from trading on my main character it's not actually anywhere near as effective as the workshop because the workshop allows you to maintain a massive army and not have to worry about paying them I think I was fielding around about 200 troops which was costing me around about 1700 a day but all of the wages could be paid for very quickly by just one single wood workshop and we're about to double our income from the wood workshops by setting up a second one right here so hello there shop worker get 
ready for me to buy this workshop. Only 14,000, no problem, you're now Wood Workshop. Away you go, my friend, good luck. Now, it's going to take them a little while to get themselves up and running, but once they do, they really do. Anyway, whilst that's happening, we're actually going to travel over to Vostrum and let them set up their lovely little workshop. It does take them a while to get the workshop up and running, so you do need to make sure you have a little bit of money ticking over from other things, like, say, other workshops or trading or taxation, whatever floats your boat. So we're back sometime later, ladies and gentlemen, and the legendary party of Spiff has, well, after only a few days, generated 82,000 gold. We are generally making around about 6,000 to 14,000 a day just by doing quite literally nothing, which is a very nice position to be in. And yes, our infinite wealth is really starting to come online, but of course we need to get our entire character and clan up to clan tier 2 before we start making ridiculous quantities of money, and also before we can join the Southern Empire as being one of their vassals, because it is relatively useful to start out as a vassal and then go on to conquer the world. So Spiff is already a very, very wealthy individual, although admittedly you wouldn't be able to tell that from the way he dresses or the weapons he uses. It's mostly just all of the cheapest stuff he can find in a shop because Sir Spiff does not have to fight. Sir Spiff can use the broken tactic system in the game, you see? Currently we have 14 points in tactics. If we were to get up to 100 points in tactics, we'd have a plus 10% simulation advantage. If you were to get it right up to 300% and beyond, which you can technically do, then you'd be getting over 30% in terms of a simulation advantage. The only issue is the tactics leveling up system is pretty damn broken. Because you can pick up tactical superiority, meaning all of your soldiers do 5% more damage in simulations. You can then couple that with ambush specialists, meaning archers deliver 60% more damage in simulations in forests. So you add those two together, suddenly you get 65% more damage from any archers if they're sat in a forest. And guess what? They also have more ammunition. Oh, and you can make your infantrymen do 50% more damage to cavalry in simulations. It just gets more and more broken. Eventually you'll hit a point if you go down the tactics path where you can auto-resolve battles far better than you could actually do by playing them. And honestly, there's no reason to not just auto-resolve every single fight you find yourself in. Anyway, I'm going to go adventure about the map and hunt down a bunch of bandits in order to get myself up to Renown level 2. If you want some tips on how to grind out Renown, I recommend going to war with one of the factions who have settlements which are really, really far away from any castles. Like, say, this settlement here of Erzenur, or this one up here of Urikaskala, because you can often defeat the peasants without anyone interfering, which is lovely. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, some time has passed and we're on the trail of some lovely looters. 35 of them, in fact, oh, and they can not outrun us. I mean, come on, have you seen us? We've got such a majestic army. Surrender or die, brigand. Oh, you'll never take us alive. I, I think I might. Right, let's just send the troops in because, after all, a true general doesn't fight his own battles. Oh, and we increase our tactics, gain some influence, gain some renown, and we didn't even lose a single soldier. Now that's a good victory. Now you will notice that there's a change in my flag and that's because I've joined the Southern Empire and in return they've given me Cyratos Castle right here. A lovely little castle, although admittedly it's seen better days, it's a bit shaken up at the moment. Its prosperity isn't too high, but equally it's not the worst it possibly could be. Now even with this level of prosperity and having a castle in two cities, this combination of land is actually only providing me with about 500 gold per day. This is terrible, because as you remember 500 gold per day is much much less than we're actually able to produce using our lovely wood workshops. Owning land is actually useless, but what isn't useless is owning a lot of factories. Now that's where the money comes from. And just to demonstrate how crazily overpowered the wood farms are, this here is my clan's profits without any wood farms. With two ironmongers working, one makes 1,607, one makes 437. At the same time, we also have a bunch of caravans running around the world, and each caravan gives me anywhere between 50 and 1,000 each day, which is exceedingly varied, but it is still rather profitable. Now I'm going to switch over to using the wood factories instead. And you're going to be noticing a slight change in my profit. Ladies and gentlemen, we now make 21,000 gold a day. This is broken to say the least, because we are generating 20,000 gold per day, which is more gold than most characters have who are running around on this map. This system is not particularly working. Now what do you do with all of this money? Well, what I've decided to do is just sink most of it into my caravans. My caravans are doing quite well at the moment, making about a thousand to six hundred each. So my caravans are running about the map with some companions who I literally hired in a pub, knew them for a day, then said, here, take 15 grand, find about 40 lads and go make me millions. And that's what they're going to do. Oh, look, we almost made 30 grand that day. Very nice. Oh, and we just sold a bunch of flax. Oh, that's very nice. And a bunch of fish and all of the hardwood in the world. Oh, the world is looking good. 
it. We're now trade level 105. We're on our way to making a lot of trade. Now, in terms of how to use trade to take over the world, one thing we can do is use great investors. So that each profitable caravan gives us an extra one renown per day or use artisan community, meaning every profitable shop gives us one renown a day. Either way, it doesn't matter. We're going to get a lot of renown from them. What is crazy powerful is villager connections. Your workshop production is increased by 25%. Now that is very nice. Anyway, we could really do with increasing our stats because in order to level up in this game, it's not a case of killing people. I need to gain a total of 28 skill points in other categories in order to level up. So that might be helping wounded soldiers heal in settlements, building and operating siege engines, spot tracks to hideouts or travel on rough terrain, just ride on a horse, use a crossbow, throw something. It's all things we can do quite easily. Speaking of which, we can go train some skills on these looters running around. Why not? Now, instead of using the auto resolve system, which I would like to do, we're actually going to attack these bad boys because I've equipped a spear and by using the spear to get a couple of kills, I'm going to gain a couple of points into getting closer to leveling up. This is the pay to win method of leveling up, ladies and gentlemen. All right, now I think it's time for me to go get myself some kills with my pointy spear. Whilst, of course, I get backed up by my lovely men in the background. Oh, that's a nice kill. Well, so one crazy broken thing in the game at the moment is horse archers because horse archers can skirmish around the enemies and they can always outrun them and they do crazy amounts of damage. Oh, my pole arm's up to nine now. Very good. Oh, there's only six of them left. Oh my goodness. This has been an absolute slaughter for the poor enemies. Oh, and they've killed my horse. Oh, well, that was going to happen. And of course, when I'm in danger, we just send all of the men in to assist. Although there's not really much to be scared of because fighting looters is not exactly too difficult. Oh no, they're all running away. That's not very nice of them. Horsies, go chase them down. Good horsies, good. Sadly, my horse is dead, but it's fine. He resurrects himself after the battle for some unknown reason. Anyway, that's a glorious success for all of us. I've gained 13 skills in the pole arm category, which is very good. Now, of course, when you're out and about on the world fighting, your troops do level up. Now, what do you do with your troops when they level up? Well, you can promote them into glorious higher categories. I know, it's amazing. Now, when it comes to upgrading your infantry, the game quite nice. It does cost money, but the game does warn you how much money it's going to cost. So we're going to upgrade this watchman. We're going to upgrade those archers. We're going to upgrade those footmen. Sure, why not? Make them all hunters. That sounds great. Get some more brigands in there. A massive veteran super shield dude. There we go. Just spend a lot of money upgrading all of my boys. Now, because this game doesn't want you making any mistakes, and so that it allows you to go back on your decisions, you won't actually be spending any money until you hit done here. So as you can see, we have 533,000 gold, 427. So yes, a lot of money. Uh, but of course, it's going to cost us 937 to upgrade our men. We don't want to do that. So instead, what you do is you just click off literally anywhere. I'm going to click on the inventory and it says, do you want to make those changes? And we say apply. And what you'll notice is that our gold didn't go down at all. We still have 500,333 men. But what you'll notice is all of the troops in my party have upgraded to exactly what they said they were. Hey, look here. Is our brand new veteran warrior dude. Yep, that's uh that's fine game. Um, oh dear, <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Upgrading troops in this game is a very important mechanic, and of course you can just cheese it like that. Another way you can absolutely defeat the troop recruiting mechanic in this game is by abusing the party system. You see, if you stand near one of your own castles, you can create a brand new party, and this party will immediately go out and try and recruit some men, then come back and assist. The only downside is that it's completely and utterly broken, because upon creating a new party, if you use a character, it doesn't cost you any resources and yet they immediately appear with five units of their culture type. So if they're of the people of the West, they immediately spawn in with five units of heavy cavalry. They spawn in with basically five late game, super good units. What you do is you take that and you immediately disband the new party. And what that means is you get the character and all of their men immediately become yours. So you've just suddenly magicked five great late game units out of thin air. You can then repeat this process as many times as you like because it costs you nothing to do so. Consequently, you can run around the map with an army much larger than you really feasibly should. You could quite easily pair it with the infinite gold, so you just buy a million grain. And then even though you'll have men deserting you about every five seconds, it doesn't matter because you'll have such a large army. Oh my, it's Oros the Hand with 46 dudes. Oh, you, my friend, are a lovely target to have. Come back here. You're not going to run away. We're going 0.1 speed ever so slightly faster than you. We will catch you. Oh, and of course, we've got some assistant. Serenor's party. Lovely. And there we go. We've caught 
up to them. And they have no wish to fight us, but we can still kill them nonetheless. And because they're 46 very well equipped men, even though it's going to be a bit of a tough fight and I could gain a lot of tactics from this, it's a very valuable fight to have indeed. All right, let us attack this actually manually. I'll try my best not to off myself by accident. Now, even though we've only been fighting for a very brief period of time, all of them have suddenly decided to rout. Oh my goodness. All right, so we're just going to have them charge down by all of our men. I'm not even going to be able to get many kills from this. And there we go. We've killed as many of the enemies as we feasibly could. Now here's another cheeky exploit uh, demonstrated by Spiff and his desire to um, improve himself at the cost of just about everything else in the game. Now when it comes to leveling up any weapon in the game, it's entirely calculated off of damage you do. What this means is once the battle's over, you can actually just straight up farm damage from anything left on the battlefield. These can include friendly troops, even my own horse. Now what does this mean in practice? Well it means I can use my bow and arrow here to straight up kill the horse of one of my own men here and don't worry it doesn't matter because he's gonna respawn with a horse as soon as the battle's over but by just shooting the horse in the head I'm gaining experience from this despite the fact that it's an ally oh and he's fallen off his horse I can also shoot him in the foot and wound him if I like as you can see we gained one increase in skill from our archery one in the horse and one in the pole arms very good now it would appear that my faction has decided that we are going to war with the northern empire which is fun and exciting Exciting. I mean, they're about of equivalent size to us, so that's gonna... Oh, actually, no, they look even larger. Oh, this is going to an extra challenge. I like it. Bam, and there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. And then for our glorious first episode in the adventures of Mountain Blade Bannerlord. My mind really wanted to say Warband. It's going to be really strange getting used to calling this one Bannerlord. But hey, I mean, there's hardly much of a difference between the two games. <laughs> Where did the eight years of game development go? Certainly not on adding new features. Nonetheless, I did actually have a lot of fun playing this game. And I have a very, very exciting second part to the video coming up very soon, of course. It's absolutely rammed full of even more exploits and even more bugs which I discovered along my journey. So hey, if you're one of the game developers, you might want to consider subscribing because there's a very interesting bug report going to be ending up in your sub feed very soon. As always, if you have enjoyed the video, feel free to give it a like as it does massively help myself out. And if you're a Patreon, thank you very much for your majestic support, you lovely sausage. And if you're sat there wondering what video you'd like to watch next after this absolute monstrosity of an exploit well then look no further than these ones on screen now hand chosen by myself to be exactly your cup of tea anyway i'll see each and every one of you in the next one have an absolutely lovely day and goodbye for now